Hallelujah. That's the title of my message this morning. It's harvest time. I want to talk to you a little bit just to kind of get things moving in a certain direction. You know, the children of Israel, and many times, many of you have heard this story many times, the children of Israel, back in the Old Testament, that's where things started. If you remember, there's a good movie that came out, by the way, called His Only Son. It was, it's a story of Abraham, and Danielle and I went and saw it, and I really enjoyed it. But you know, that there was a time when there was no Israel, and many times we don't know where we're going because we don't know where we've been. We don't know what God's going to do because we don't know what God's already done. And so I want you to know that God, there was a time whenever there was no nation and God had a plan to bring forth hope to a world that was filled with darkness. He wants to bring hope to your life this morning. He wants to, he wants to show up on the inside of your heart and he wants to transform things. But he's very methodical about the way he has done uh, salvation history, if we could call it that. And, and so God called a man named Abraham out of our Iraq, really. It's modern day Iraq. It was called Ur of the Chaldees back then. It was a Babylonian province, uh, the, the place of Babylon. And, and God called this man out. You know what's interesting is that Abraham's father was a maker of idols. His name was Terah. That's where we get the idea of Terephim, which is where idols come from. It's a family kind of idol. So Abraham's father was an idol maker. The whole world was bound with ignorance. The whole world, no, no one knew God. There were some people that knew God, but it was very sparse, the people that knew God. But God had a plan to create a nation. And he called Abraham and he said, come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a great nation. And he promised him that he was going to give him land. Because you see, in order for God to be able to create and to do the work that he wanted to do, the people had to have a place to dwell. They had to have a place to live. And he promised them, I'm going to give you the land. And you know what? Abraham never saw that promise come forth. But I got to tell you that God is a promise keeper. Amen. He gives promises. He's given promises in his word. He's given promises to many of you in your hearts and in your lives. And sometimes maybe you wonder, when will the promise why does the promise tear? Why does it take so long for the promise to come? I just want to give you hope this morning. Hold on to the Lord because the promise is coming. Amen. Now, you got to ask yourselves, well, well, what promise are you talking about? That's a good question. You need to ask the things that God has promised unto you. But listen to me. Sometimes we create promises in our own mind. We think God has promised us things because it's things that we actually want. The book of James talks about the fact that you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you ask the mess. Because you ask because you want to fulfill the lusts of your heart. See, God's not about fulfilling the lusts of your heart, church. Amen. I'm just here to tell you the truth this morning. I'm feeling real sweet, but it could change any minute, right? <laughs> Listen, the, the Lord is not interested in fulfilling the lusts of our heart. The way we live our lives contrary to the word of God. And then what we do is in disobedience, we just walk outside of God's will. We walk outside of God's word. Then on the backside, we're asking him, won't you bless it, Lord? No! God does not work like that, child of God. God works according to his word. Blood has been shed for this word. Jesus died on the cross to fulfill this word. God works according to his word. So let us understand. When we find strife, confusion in the midst of our lives, let us understand that many times we have brought things upon ourselves. But this is the good news. He's a healer. He's a healer. I was, look, th are these things working now? I want to show you something. Now, y'all going to laugh. I wasn't going to do this, but I think I am. Can you put me on channel two? <laughs> All right. So I was going to, I, I was going to, I wasn't planning on doing this. Well, I did plan on it, then I didn't plan on it. But you know, I just want you to understand something. Y'all gonna laugh for a second, but it's okay. Y'all can laugh. Once you get your laughter out, though, I wanna make a point. I wanna make a point. I believe in resurrection power. Yes. Yes. I believe in resurrection power. I'm gonna tell you why. Because look at this. <laughs> that was me, man. <laughs> 17 years old. Second trip in Riyadh. 17 years old. Messing around with a 27 year old woman. Found myself locked up in Greenville Springs Mental Hospital because of the life that was going on. And the devil wanted to destroy me. The devil wanted to take me out. The devil wanted to destroy me through drugs and alcohol and fornication and, and living from the lust of my flesh and, and living in the midst of the world. But I'm here to tell you, he don't get the last step. Hallelujah. And he wants to be free. 
And he wants to use people like you. And he wants to be you go ahead and Lord help us not to yield ourselves to the will of the flesh. Not to yield ourselves to the will of the world. But instead to yield ourselves to the will of the Holy One of Israel. Who loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross. Hallelujah. The Passover lamb. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. It's harvest time. And it all started that God promised Abraham a land. And guess what? Before you know it, God's people, Israel, are bound in Egyptian bondage. A perfect type of, of the world under the bondage of a satanic curse. That's what I'm calling it now. I don't call it a cult. It's a satanic curse. The world is under its bondage, church. We got to wake up. We got to wake up and we got to realize that the world is not our friend. The world does not love us. The spirit of the world wants to destroy us. The spirit of error is lying to us. It's promises, it's promising us things that are never going to come to pass. It's never going to come to pass. Every time you turn around, there's another thing that our flesh wants and it pre 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 prevents us. It restrains us from moving forward in the things of God. But they found themselves in Exodus. I'm sorry, in Egypt. And God performed an Exodus. Hallelujah, he performed an Exodus. You can, you can take me off. I guess I can do it myself. Get off of this right here. He, he performed an Exodus. And what he, he did it through a Passover lamb. A perfect type of Jesus. A Passover lamb without spot or blemish. They, they would have to cut those things open and listen, they would have to flay it open and they have to, they'd have to check the intestines. They'd have to check the, the liver. They'd have to check the kidneys. They had to make sure there was no tumor in there. They would have to inspect the skin. Had to make sure there was no sores, no lesions. And guess what? After they went through that one, if they found one, boom, they had to throw it out. And then they'd start all over again. And as soon as they thought they had one, if they found one little, no, because see, it, it's a type of Jesus. It's a type of Jesus and it's a type to remind us that this world that we live on was fallen through the sin of Adam. And that mankind born of Adam was born in sin. And all of us have found ourselves sinners born in Adam. That's why man must be born again. I can't emphasize the importance of this enough. Man must be born again. I didn't say it. I didn't write it. Jesus told it to the religious leader. Amen. John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a religious leader, comes at night. He says, Rabbi, Rabbi, great teacher, great teacher. Look at the things that you're doing. Jesus cuts to the chase. You know what? Look, somebody might watch this and listen, brother. I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I didn't uh, offend anybody yesterday. But, you know, and I'm just going to tell. I didn't say he said it, but I'm going to say. Somebody came up to me yesterday. I went to, to a funeral thing. He said, man, you're the best looking minister. And, and I said, you, you think that's going to get me far in the kingdom? <laughs> and I really didn't mean it that way. I didn't mean it like to be ugly about it. I didn't mean it to be ugly about it. Even that picture up there. You know, somebody told me, like, look how cute you are. Just wait till he opens his mouth. Wait until he opens his mouth and you hear what spews out of that if you think that's going to be cute. Nothing but obnoxiousness and rebellion. Listen, the point is this. What is the point? The point is, is that it's all about Jesus. It's all about our life. It's all about hope. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about us living our lives. And we were in slavery. I was enslaved to sin. Yeah. I was thinking that I was, and I was feeding my flesh and thinking that it was going to bring me hope. It was going to bring me life. It was going to bring me joy. And it only brought me further and further and further into a mess, into a pit. Oh, you preach too hard? No, we don't preach hard enough. That's the problem with the church. I've already said it. Recently, I made the comment that, listen, we got two, two problems in the church. And listen, let me just say this. When we're talking about deliverance, and we're going to talk about this more as the days come forward. When we're talking about deliverance, let us understand this. That in the, in the, the course of where we are in the church right now, most day a lot of people say it. I'm not talking to y'all. Hopefully y'all say it. But I'm trying to make a point. Did you see the way, if you don't understand the way that the church world has changed since the 80s even? Come on, come on, come on. The way the message has changed since the 80s? We can't even preach biblical Christianity anymore because we're worried we're going to offend someone. No, let the word of God speak. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. Listen, you don't, bring, you don't in, increase church by 
by changing the light, putting up a light show and having smoke and, and you know, making the message tailored to where the world feels comfortable. That's how the world does stuff. Right. The world does stuff. Like you, you serve the world, right? I mean, if you're Burger King, what? Have it your way. You don't want pickles on your hamburger? Well, then guess what? You ain't got to have pickles on your hamburger because you buying a hamburger. But if you're going to come to the Lord, if you're going to come to the Lord, you ain't doing it your way, my friend. You got to do it his way because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him. Yeah, yeah get in through Muhammad. Come on, I told that man the other day. I'm like, look, brother, one of us is wrong. You ain't with One of us is wrong. It ain't two, it's only one. Jesus said this. See, they say, oh, he's a good prophet. Hold on a second. How can he be a good prophet? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. How can he be a good prophet if he was lying, if you're thinking he's a liar? No, there's only one way. And the Passover lamb was the first type. There were slaves in Egypt, and God said, you will take a lamb without blemish, and you will take its blood, and you will paint it on the doorpost and the sidepost. And you know what the Lord did? The Lord sent the death angel. He sent judgment. Listen to me, church. God is sending judgment again on the land. That's, right. That's why it's so important that preachers stand up, rise up, right. let the Holy Spirit fill them up, and let the Holy Spirit speak to them in these darkened days to speak the truth, to quit holding back, and to be fearful, with it, to be bound by a spirit of fear that people aren't going to come back anymore. No, judgment is coming back upon this earth, and if our hearts aren't right, listen to me, if our hearts aren't right, <clears throat> And don't sit back there looking at me with your religious, down your, with your religious eyes. Say, oh, brother, I know some stuff. It don't, knowledge puffs up. That's right. Knowledge yeah. puffs up. Love. Oh, knowledge, but that, now knowledge is the beginning of, look, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't throw knowledge out, but let us mix knowledge with love. Let us understand the love of Christ and it's poured out through the blood of the Passover lamb. The children of Israel, they, they exited Egypt. Hallelujah. They exited Egypt. And you know what the Lord said in Leviticus 23? There were four feasts. One was the Passover. On the 14th day of the first month, you will, you will bring the Passover. He will be a lamb without spot or blood. And you will offer him, and you will roast him in fire. See, fire represents judgment in church. Fire represents judgment. And guess what judgment was laid upon the Passover lamb, Jesus. And he said on the 14th day, you will have the Passover. And then from the 15th day for a week, it begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For a whole week, they would have unleavened bread. We did an awesome uh, thing at the event. It was beautiful. I want to try to do it for the church next year. This is like a Christianized version of the Passover. Not because we're trying to keep feasts so that we can be more holy, but to understand the God of glory and that he's been working in you in history for thousands of years and to see how he was painting a picture because he didn't want you to miss it. He doesn't want you to miss it because he loves you. He loves me. And he doesn't want us to miss it. But for that week of unleavened bread, you know, leaven is another name for yeast. And yeast in the Bible is a type of sin. Well, why would it be yeast? In? Because a little leaven leavens what? The whole of them. How does that work? Because yeast is a living organism. That's right. And when you put a pinch of yeast in a batch of dough, it begins to spread. See, you can't taste a little bit of sin. You go on. Let us, no, no, let us not go on. Help us. Because just a little sip. That's right. And you think you're okay. Compromise. Yeah. Compromise with sin, That's right. compromise with the world, compromise. You know what it's going to do? It's going to let that yeast spread through the whole batch. For seven days, they had to get all the yeast out. Get the loaf of bread out, friend. Yeah, but no, it was even more than that. I was thinking this morning, this must be where spring cleaning came from. Don't laugh at me. I think it is. I think that a king size bed came out of the Bible too. That's another story, but I think it's pretty clean. Listen, they had to, they had to get on, that was talking about that. They had to get on the baseboards, man. And it's springtime, is it not? Spring cleaning. Take all the leaven out of the house for a week. Listen, I'm not talking about don't put it in your food. I'm talking about get it out your house. No trace of sin for seven days. 
Now listen, I've got to tell you the beauty of this. Because look, the Word of God says, it says it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. The Lord said this um, through the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm sorry, First Corinthians, it's actually 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, where he says that Christ... He says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out the old leaven. For Christ, our Passover, has been crucified. See, that old leaven, that old life, that old worldly thinking, those old ways of the world, that's the old leaven. The Lord is saying, purge that thing out of your life. You know, how do you, how do you purge something? It's repentance. Y'all getting tired? Of, I hope y'all aren't getting tired of me talking about repenting. It's a repentance. That's right. What does it mean to repent? It means to change your mind. It means to let the Lord have his way in your heart. It means his word is right and you and I have been wrong. And I did. I put my own personal pronoun out in there. You and I. That way you can't get mad at me. No, listen. We all in this together. It's the word of the living God. When we line up with the word of God, not our own opinions. And listen, are we in the word to find out what God's trying to tell us? You know? I mean, Lord, help us. So, so he, listen, I want you to understand something. Jesus fulfilled when he came to earth the first time. When he clothed himself in human flesh, he fulfilled the Passover. Paul said in the New Testament, Christ, our Passover, has been crucified for us. He fulfilled unleavened bread. He fulfilled the unblemished lamb. How? Because he had no sin. He was incorruptible seed, born of a virgin. God sent the bread from heaven that if any man will eat this bread, hallelujah, he will find life. But this is where it gets really good, Christian. Oh, man, the first time there was somebody in the church and they kept trying to tell me the importance of feasts. And I was just like, yeah, okay, one day. But whenever I thought about this, see, this is a sheep right here. About an omer of barley right there. Not, probably not, but that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Two liters about. Jesus in his first coming, see, this is its harvest time, my friend. We're talking about harvest this morning. And Jesus in his first coming was the Passover lamb. He was the unleavened bread. But let me tell you something about the Feast of First Fruits. The Feast of First Fruits occurred on the first, the day after the Sabbath, after the Passover. What's the easier way for me to tell you in American terms? The first Sunday, Sunday. after Passover. <laughs> Dude, what? <laughs> Say, what? Are you telling me that Jesus was crucified on Passover 1,400 years after the first Passover? And are you telling me that he fulfilled unleavened bread because he was also the, blemish, the, the, the lamb without blemish? And are you telling me that Jesus resurrected on the feast of of first fruits, 1400 and something years after the first, and I'm telling you that's exactly what happened. They'd go out there into that field because it was the first fruit before the harvest, because from there you start counting 50 days. Ha <laughs> ha! Are you telling me 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead? The fire of God fell from heaven on the day of Pentecost. That's what I'm telling you. Are you telling me that you count 50 days from the Feast of First Fruits and then Pentecost? Are you telling me that 50 days after on the Feast of Pentecost is when the harvest really takes place? That's right. And so I'm trying to tell you that the Feast of First Fruits was the first one. And they go out there with that sickle. Listen to me. The Lord has a sickle in his hand. Revelation chapter 14, there's a sickle in his hand. He's about to reap the earth, my friend. He's about to reap the vine that belongs to him. And he's also going to reap the vine of the earth. And he's going to put it into the wine press of God's wrath. And you do not want to be in the second reaping. Right. You want to be part of the first thing. Right. They go in there with that sickle and they grab that sheaf. And you know what the priest does? He waves it. Now I've just got this. Feeling because you know this is made Hobby Lobby man. That's a that's a cool dude, right? He's a believer, from what I hear. I just believe this. The first time I taught on this many many years ago, I could imagine it in my mind. The sun's in the perfect spot. He gets the sheaf. 
And he doesn't really understand. This is 1,400 years before Jesus is going to raise from the dead. This is how many thousands of years before the rapture of the church is going to take place. See, you do understand that the resurrection is synonymous with the rapture. Right. We need to teach. We need to teach. The resurrection is the rapture. Jesus is the first fruits of the yeah. resurrection. And that man, that priest would get out there and he'd shake that. Can you imagine what it really looked like glinting in the sun? You know how sometimes you see that dust particles when there's a little light shining bright? Could you imagine all of Israel around, behind the priest as he's waving that? And all them little particles flying up in the air. I don't know if you can see it, but I can see it. It's like whenever the rapture of the church takes place. Hallelujah. And all the people of God going up in the air to meet the Lord, and there we shall be with the Lord forevermore. I want you to know it's harvest time, and I believe it's so close. Oh, people have been saying that for years. Listen to me. Be careful. Peter, Peter wrote, he said, in the end days, there will be scoffers. Yep. There will be scoffers who will say, hey, Ben's saying he's coming. Where's he, where's he at? You've been holding on to something. No, you need to understand something. The Lord is long suffering. He's long suffering. He's waiting for one more. No, nay, may I say, he's waiting for Matt to get his heart. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He's waiting for us to get our heart right. Because he's long suffering. And he doesn't want any, any to perish. That's how much God loves us. He doesn't want any to perish. Hallelujah. So there we go. We got feast of first fruits. That's a resurrection. Hallelujah. And it's harvest time, my friend. Look, throughout the whole of Scripture, the harvest theme keeps repeating itself. And one of the first ones I put in here comes out of Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the sower. I want you to understand that this world is hostile to the seed of the gospel. The seed, this world system, the spirit of error, the spirit of antichrist is hostile. To the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. The parable of the sower says this. A sower went out to sow. The seed that he sowed is the, is the word of God. That's going to bring hope. That's why I believe that the Lord wanted you to understand this morning. He's sowing seed this morning. Yes. The things that are being spoken. Not because I'm speaking them. But because the Holy Spirit is going to reveal truth of God's word into your heart and in your life. If you will let him. That's it. That's it. See, we talked about Martha and Mary the other day, and that Martha was full of distractions, yet Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. They were literally in the same house. They were all in the same house. Mary was receiving of the Lord. Martha was so distracted, she completely missed. So there could be groups of people, and I venture to say that there will be groups of people. Some, you, 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 might, miss, you might miss your appointment. I'm not saying that just because you missed this service that you missed your appointment. What I'm trying to say is this is just a type. You can sit through the service. The Holy Spirit can say, I want to plant my seed in your heart. I want to bring a harvest in your own personal life because I want you to be part of my harvest in the end. But you can literally miss it because of unbelief, because of doubt, because of doors of sin that we've opened in and we've allowed the enemy to cloud our mind and to begin to whisper to us instead of being able to hear the word of the Lord. We're hearing the lies of the enemy and we become hard. Our heart becomes callous. Our eyes become dim. Our ears become deafened. We cannot hear. We cannot see. We cannot see the things of God because we love our flesh so much and the things that, that draw us into the system of the world that we can't even let go of it. And we cannot hear the voice of God the way that God wants us to be able to hear Him. He wants to bring His life. He wants to bring freedom. And He can bring freedom to that 17-year-old dude up there. I promise you, He can bring freedom to you. I was so bound up I didn't know where I was going tomorrow. I was a mess, man. But I, I was trying to plead with people yesterday. A girl that I used to go to CrossFit place with, I've been knowing, I've been knowing her mama, man. Look, if I said her name, happy y'all would know her. I'm not going to say her name, though. But she used to exercise a lot. Okay. Her daughter is a nurse. All right? There you go. Y'all got Some of y'all got it. Okay? And I, said, and I was looking at that picture when she came up. I'm like, look at I can see it. People were distracted. People raised in the gospel. People raised in the church. And the enemy's coming against us trying to steal the, the harvest of God. Right, right. I'm like, this guy was hurt. People are hurting. But he showed up and he changed me. I'm ever thankful. I'm ever thankful 
to the Lord for changing me. I was going to die. I was going to go to hell. And listen to me, Christian. You, we better wake up. We better wake up. And we're sitting here, and, we're, and we are purposely disobeying the word of God in every yes. more life. Yes. I'm, yes. I don't know who I'm talking to. Yeah. I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking yes. to myself. We better wake up. We better plead with God. We're talking about our eternal soul. Amen. Lord, help us get our hearts right. The parable of the sower of the world is hostile to the seed of the gospel. There's fowls, there's stones, there's thorns, right? The fowl of the air want to steal the seed before it can even be planted in your heart. The stones, things that are left in the soil. Listen to me. We got to, can you earn your salvation? Please don't take, put something in my mouth that I'm not saying. Who, who do you know that's preached against a works based gospel any more than me? There's a few of them out there, but they ain't that many. At least not the people you know. I come against a works based message for God knows how long. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about plowing, my friend. I'm talking about plowing and laboring in prayer. I'm talking about getting into the presence of the Lord. Jesus paid a high price. The veil was rent so we could enter into the place of God, into the presence of God. We can avail ourselves into his presence, but yet, do we? No. We sit idly by many of us. And we don't allow God to draw us into his presence. Lord, help us. I said it the other day, but I'll say it again. It used to be that preachers behind the pulpit had talus knees and tears in their eyes. That's right. Now we just, you know, everybody's looking for a good looking young preacher that knows how to do a budget and knows how to, you know, knows how to do some cool stuff and, and, to, and to be relevant to the world. That's right. That's not how the church was built, my friend. The church was built on the blood of the martyrs. The church was built on the blood of the martyrs like seed in the soil and the Holy Spirit. Spirit moving with power, signs and wonders, and illuminating the gospel of Jesus Christ and transforming people's lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's how the church was built. People like you, people like me, where the truth of the gospel entered into our hearts and transformed our lives. And then we take Jesus outside of these walls and we let those that are hurting and dying out there that there's a real God and he sent his son to die for us. The world is hostile. Fowls of the air. It's talking about the enemy. The stones that are in the dirt. They're trying to prevent the root. That's right. They're trying to prevent the root. Things that you're not willing to get rid of out of your life. I mean, the Word of God doesn't say that's exactly what it is, but I've pondered that for years. That's the one thing that it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. It just tells you the result. That the stones prevent root. And when persecution comes over the Word of God. Not because, not because you got a good job. Well, maybe so, if you're serving the Lord, because you got a good job and you got a promotion, and then everybody around you hates you now. <laughs> oh. Well, wait, hold on a second. <laughs> God bless them. Right. Well, all you got to do is put yourself under the downspout of the Holy Spirit and let the glory of God minister to you. You get a little bit of that stuff, too. Get, let that bitterness get out of your heart, child of God. That's right. Don't let that bitterness tear you out. It's pollution from the enemy. You can't serve God with bitterness in your heart. That's right. Listen to me. Maybe people treated you wrong all of your life. Maybe people said stuff. A lot of people did wrong. I had to call my girls up the other day. I was wrong. I've been told them five times. I don't think it's getting through to me. You don't understand, baby. I was wrong. And many times I thought I was doing right. But I was wrong in so many ways. Lord, help us to come clean. Help us to come clean. Help us to not be prideful. Don't be prideful all the way to the grave. Lord, help us. You know, we're talking about a harvest. Paul said, I planted Apollo's water, but God gives the increase. He is the Lord of the harvest. Neither he that plants nor he that waters is anything. He deserves the glory. He deserves the honor. Hallelujah. God gives the green cream. Then he says that he that plants and he that waters are one. That's right. We're all one. We're so, do, do, have, you, have you ever noticed how jealousy will try to enter your heart? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just going to be real. Yeah. We got to be careful. Yes. The enemy is so slick. Yes. Yes. He's so slick. Yes. And he will, he will put that poison in you. Jealousy will enter your heart and your mind. 
And if you don't check that quick, your little snake, he'll start hatching eggs. And before you know it, you're so bound up with bitterness and frustration and irritation. You hate people that love you, man. And you'll think you're right for doing it. My God. Lord help us. Lord, right. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. God gives the increase. We're all one. We're supposed to be one in Christ. We're supposed to be of one mind, one accord. We're supposed to be in unity of the Spirit. If we could get in unity of the Spirit, I believe that the Spirit will really start moving. We can't say nothing yet, my friend. No, no, really. I mean, thank you, Lord, for anything and everything that you do for us. But I want more. I want his glory. I want more. I want more of his presence. I want the fire of Pentecost. Why? Because I want to see souls one into the kingdom of God. And guess what? This ain't a one-man show, my friend. I can't. Look, the word that came through that prophet, I don't know what you think about it, but the word that came from that prophet, you know what he said? He said the church That's right. was going to be a harvesting combine. That's right. Oh. And listen, he wants to use the body. The Lord told me, he was just confirming what the Lord had already spoke to me at these altars in prayer. When the Lord said, get out of my way. I want to use my people. And he has been using you people. Yeah. I have seen and Don't let the devil steal from you. He's sending people every time with different gifts and talents. This can't be a one man show. Who wants it to be a one man show? God wants to get glory out of your lives, out of our lives. He says that we are, each one will receive his reward. When I get back, I'll be gone for a little while, but when I get back, we're going to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. Because listen to me, Christian, not only do you want to make it into glory, but you want to have your reward with you. You want to have your reward with you. Because there are many that will make it in, but they're going to be smelling like smoke, my friend. And their reward will be burnt up. Because the motives were wrong. And listen to me, the enemy is tricky. And he will make you think that you were doing everything right when in reality you were. Lord, check our hearts. So we're laborers together with God. And you know what the Paul, Paul said? You are the field of God. The field of God. We're talking about harvest, Christian. I want to talk to you real quick, too, about this. I want to introduce you to a man named Epaphras. His name it means lovely. Paul talked about him in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12, and he said he's my fellow prisoner. And he labors fervently for you through prayer. The Lord said, he, this is what the Lord said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send laborers into the field. Well, how do you labor? How do you labor? Do you, you don't put your hands on a real plow. I mean, maybe that could be part of it, but... Epaphras, his name means lovely. He's in prison with Paul. What is he doing? Paul's watching him. Look at him. He's laboring fervently in prayer. We need to get, listen, thank you, Jesus, for you guys that have been praying. And I know that many of you have, even whenever you don't come to the services that we're having in prayer. We, nothing's going to be done without prayer. Nothing is going to be done without prayer. We need to pray. We need to call upon the Lord. We need to ask God to move in our midst and we need more intercessors. I'm praying and declaring in the name of Jesus that the Lord will give us more intercessors that will labor fervently even whenever they're in prison. What is an intercessor? It means to pray. It means to call upon God that he would move. Lord, you know, in order to be an intercessor, you got to, you know, first off, a couple of things have to happen. Number one, you got to give your heart to Jesus. Yeah. Number one, yeah. right? Then you got to yield to the will of God. And when you yield to the will of God, you know something very, very strange happens. Well, I can't sing, but you know I try. <laughs> Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of life will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory. Glorious fame, glory, and grace. I don't know. One of those, both of them are good. But I will tell you this. See, the closer we get to Jesus, the less worried we are about this old nasty self. Why you want to talk so bad about myself? Because yourself will get in the way you get in the Oh, because in your mind and in your heart, I demand to get my way. Justice will be served. 
Listen to me. They got people like, if you don't do something the way that they want you to do, they won't punish you. Well, guess what then? My mama don't get to talk to me. <laughs> she ain't gonna get to talk to me for a whole month. I'm gonna show her who the boss is, man. Look, you better get that stinking thinking out of your heart and out of your life, my friend. That will hem you up. Can we be like the meek and lowly lamb? Yeah. Only if we allow our flesh to be crucified. That's right. Only if we allow that Passover lamb to have his way in our heart and in our lives. I'm, I'm trying to help you. Right. I'm trying to help the church. We don't like to hear it, but we need to hear it bad. The preacher needs to be the first one to hear it. Oh, man, we come up with some crazy stuff in our mind. Yeah. I'm going to show them. What you going to show them? You're going to hem yourself up, man. Yeah, yeah. You're going to put calluses That's on right. your own heart. That's right. Hallelujah, Lord, soften our hearts. Yeah. Rub the oil. Be like a balm of Gilead. Be like medicine on my heart. Hallelujah. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know, there's another scripture where he says this. That he's got his fan in his hands. Yeah. And he's going to cleanse or purge his threshing floor. He's going to winnow out the grain. He's going to put the grain in the barn. And the chaff is going to be burnt up of that bunch of fire. Mm. See, you got to have wind to winnow. Mm. What does winnowing mean? It means during the grain harvest, they would, they would first crush it to separate the chaff, which is that husk, kind of like on a popcorn seed. To separate the chaff from the seed, from the grain. And then, sometimes they would pour the grain off of a roof whenever the wind was blowing. But sometimes they'd have almost something like a pitchfork and they'd throw it up in the air. Mm -hmm. And they'd let the wind blow. See, that's the pneuma of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. We need the Holy Spirit to be yes, involved in the yes. midst of our life. So that whenever he reveals that chaff, listen, he'll begin to blow it away. And it's going to be, he wants to burn that up. Yes. He wants to burn that up to get that out of our lives. But let me tell you something. It's also, it's really talking about the difference between those that are going to be saved and those that aren't. There's going to be a remnant on this earth. <laughs> everybody is not going to be saved. Everybody is God's creation, but not everybody is his children. That's the Bible. How does a person become the child of God? <coughs> to them that believed in him, he gave them power to become the son. How do I believe in him? You hear the truth of the gospel that you were born in Adam as a sinner. Right. Well, I didn't even know that. Okay, well, that's the problem with the church. <laughs> we need to tell people. All of us were born in Adam as a sinner, and that's why Jesus said you must be born again. Born again. See, whenever I've been doing this lately, because, you know, we've been praying these little prayers, and I'm not saying that little prayers are a bad thing to pray, but if we think that just because we prayed somebody to repeat after us, that that's true salvation, we got another thing coming. That's right. True salvation requires brokenness of spirit. True salvation requires I realize that I have offended you, God. I realize I have gone against you, and I desire to yield my life to you. True repentance and forgiveness and salvation will require that the old man die right. and that a new man be resurrected Amen. in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He wants to burn it up. And unfortunately, listen to me. The people that people are going to be burned up in judgment. You understand that? Help us. Soften our hearts, Lord. People are going to die. Do you, do you believe? Listen, I asked you this morning, the first thing I asked you, do you believe in the re resurrection power of God? Do you believe in miracles? Yes. 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 Do you believe in judgment? Yes. Come. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Listen, you don't have to fear judgment. You just got to get your heart right. Right. You just got to let the Lord get a hold of your heart. You don't have to fear judgment. I'm not trying to provoke people by fear to give their heart to Jesus. That don't work. That won't. But if you fall in love with the Lord, if you will yield yourself to him and quit blaming him for everything, quit blaming, oh, no, this is a good preacher right here. Quit blaming everybody else around me for everything. No, it's time we stand up. It's time we man up. It's time we woman up. And we realize, did people hurt you? Absolutely they hurt you. Welcome to the world. Amen. We've all been hurt. Every last one. But you ain't been hurt like me. Probably not. Nah. But somebody's been hurt worse than you. That's right. Right. I've heard stories of women that were repeated. I said it last week. I think repeatedly raped by their grandfather for years and years and years. And you know what they're doing now? They're living for Jesus. They're painting for Jesus. And they're telling people about the goodness of Jesus' love. Right. He's healed them. That's He's right. delivered That's them. Right. That's right. And they have hope. I mean, was it that bad for you? It might have been close, but I don't know if it was that bad 
have for you. I'm just here to offer you the hope of Jesus and he can heal you if you will let him. But if you demand to get your own justice, you're going to live full of bitterness and you're never going to be able to be free. Help us, Lord. The fan is in his hand. The new mother of the Holy Spirit is blowing. He's wanting to get rid of the child because he wants to put the grain in the barn. He wants you to be grain in the barn. Amen? He wants every last one of us to make it. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves us. He loves you. He's proven it. I know you can feel it right now that what I'm telling you is true. When you walk out of here, though, you know what's going to be waiting? I don't know for sure. It'd be interesting if it is. Some black birds that look like ravens will be out there. <laughs> if they're not there physically, they'll be there spiritually. Right. Every opportunity that lion devil gets right. he wants to steal yes, the yes, sin yes, out of your heart. Yes, sir. He wants to make you forget what was spoken. Yeah. He wants to put you night night, my friend. That's right. Just go ahead and take your sleep. It's going to be okay. And we sleep, and we sleep, and we miss. Lord, wake us up. Restore the name of Jesus. Listen, he didn't just resurrect. He is the resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. If you can put up there, uh, for, I, want to, I want you to put this one up there. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. I want you to see this one because, look, this is new. Oh, you can't? Oh, okay. Well, let me just tell you what it says. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. We're having trouble. We need our technical guy support to show up. Amen. Or, to, to, you know, he's here. He's giving time. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead. You know, Corinthians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. So what does that mean, preacher? It means it's in the New Testament. I'm just saying, because I don't know all of you people like I want to. I don't know what y'all know about the Bible. Corinthians ain't Chronicles, and it ain't Colossians. It was a letter written to the Corinthian church, and it's in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul wrote it. And this is what he said. The Apostle Paul, mighty scholar. He's one that's connecting dots, my friend. Oh, the Holy Spirit's connecting many, many dots, even in a fisherman like Peter. But look, these dots are really getting connected really fast. It's not just a like connect the dot thing like we used to draw with a pencil. It's a computer. <laughs> and it's happening. And look what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. See, that may not be a big deal to you, but when you got a New Testament passage that confirms what I'm trying to tell you in the Old Testament. And not only did he resurrect on the Feast of First Fruits, the Apostle Paul said, I'm telling you right now, I didn't read the Old Testament more than any of you ever will. And I see it right there. That's right. He's the first fruits from the dead. The first fruits. Jesus. Listen, you know what you start doing? You count from the Feast of First Fruits 50 days. And every day you're expecting that the harvest is getting ripe. It's getting ready. Listen to me. In the beginning, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, it began the ripening of the harvest. My friend. We are so close. I believe that with it. I know. I know other people have said it. Don't fall asleep <laughs> when I'm trying to tell you this. We're getting close, my friend. The harvest is ripening, and the Lord is about to take us home. I believe that. I do believe that. Hallelujah. Yes. Martha, your brother will rise again. He told that to Martha. He said, Lazarus. He said, your brother will rise again. Do you believe it? I believe he will, Lord. I believe that he will in the last day. He will resurrect. He said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall never die. That's right. Never die. Never die. And so and I'm just trying to say, like, we're living, and I, I know that it's hard to get a revelation of it. I do know it is. We live on a physical earth. I get it. We have pains. We have sorrows. I really do understand it. You, I'm, I don't need to keep talking about my own family, do I? You think that I don't have any pains and sorrows, man? Come on. I'm crying out. Lord, Lord, bring healing. <laughs> bring healing. We all have pains and sorrows. But listen. He says he's the resurrection and the life. Listen, he's offering eternal life. This world is temporary. Your nice truck you drive, temporary. Yep. Your nice house you live in, temporary. All your degrees, dumb. That's what Paul said. It's all dumb. It's like a pile of dumb. 
says that if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Say it with me right now if you would. Say it with me right now. Come on, you can do it. Say it. Say, I believe you died. I believe you died. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you died for my sin. I believe you rose from the dead. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every mind, every heart, every mouth that uttered those words right now, you would allow the seed of your truth to enter inside of their hearts, that you would begin a process of a harvest, Lord, that your life and your hope would begin to spring up on the inside of them. Lord, you are the God of glory. You are the Lord of the harvest. We trust you, oh my God. I believe that. I believe that word. <laughs> I believe God is good. I believe he's a miracle working God. I'm telling you. I believe in the resurrection. I, I've experienced resurrection. I haven't done it all right. I haven't, I haven't always walked the right path. Even after I've felt and experienced his love and his goodness. I've ventured off and gone the wrong way. But I believe it with everything in me that he's a resurrection power miracle working God. There's nothing he can't do. He can open up blind and eyes. He can open up deaf and ears. He can save the vilest of sinners. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't. I don't want Osama bin Laden to go to hell. I mean, it is what it, life is what it is. It is what it is. People are going to go to hell. I don't want to. Billions and billions of years of torment, and then it's just getting started. Yes. Come on, come on, man. Come on, church. Jesus preached on hell. And the fire is not quenched. The worm doesn't die. It will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to like I'll remind you. Amen. The world is asleep. Everybody that I go talk to out there, look, we win. Dude, that was an awesome Friday, man. After we worshiped the Lord, I'm telling you, praise the Lord, dude. I know I said it in the beginning, but then people told Bill, that was some beautiful worship on the other side of the pavilion. If we could have hurt ourselves, I'm telling you right now, dude, thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you for a heart. And look, that little thing I bought, man, it done paid for itself. Oh, man, anyway, that's another story. <laughs> The work, and then the weather changed. The wind started blowing. I felt like I was just the Holy Spirit flying off of that lake. Yeah. That would say what y'all want, but I didn't tell someone. I told somebody on this three thirty three in the morning. Weird number, I know. I got up the morning of. I went to Morgan City Stadium. I got up on the stadium. I began to look at the city and all the lights, and I began to just prophesy or prophesy, pray over the city. And then all of a sudden, the wind kicked up, just like it did on the lake. Cool breeze comes blowing through there, and I thought to myself, boy, wouldn't it be beautiful if this was how it was this afternoon? And exactly in the midst, and when we begin to worship the Lord, uh, are you in control of nature knowing my God is? He's the one that tells the storm to stop. And that cool wind started blowing off of that lake. Woo! I was thinking to myself, Oh, your sweet spirit. The pneuma of God. He wants to bring refreshing into your life. Listen, the devil wants to keep you bound up, my friend. Don't let him do it. Keep coming back.
back to church even when you don't want to. The devil's going to attack you tonight probably. But he's a liar. He's a liar and the father of lies. You know, that's one thing I'm thankful. Even though my dad didn't really know what he was talking about, maybe. He said, you better pull yourself up by the bootstraps, boy. What are you, what's all this sniveling and crying about? Like, you know, he didn't have, look, I'm glad that Lauren had a crying presence. I really am. But you know what? Thank God for a little bit of perseverance. Thank God for a little bit of endurance. Thank God. Make me a little bit tougher in the spirit, Lord. Help me not to get my feelings so easily hurt. Oh, give me a backbone. Come on, Jesus. I need a backbone. I need to get strong. People ain't going to like me. Jesus already told us they're not going to like us. If they hate you, remember they hated me. The devil has an assignment on your life. Quit blaming the people around you. I know that people are supposed to love you. I know that. I'm supposed to love you. And if I forget to tell you, hi, that you look beautiful this morning, I'm sorry. I didn't do it on purpose. I'm over there trying to fill out prison applications for the men so they go to prison. And before we start church, we're just trying to serve people the best I know how. So if I miss telling you how beautiful you all look this morning, please forget. Because uh, y'all look really good, especially when you're smiling. Hallelujah. But quit blaming people. Because you know what the Word of God says? You're not, you're, you don't war out the flesh. Come on. That's right. That's what Paul said to the Ephesian church. You're not in a war against flesh and blood. But principalities and power, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. The enemy was, well, why is he using my mama that's a Christian? Because sometimes our mamas that are Christians allow the enemy to use them. Just like my daughter's daddy did, missed it sometimes. Amen. We missed it sometimes. Help us, Lord. Right? Okay, I think I'm getting that point. We're almost done. Understand this. Life is temporary. We can spend it on temporary pleasures or we can plan on being resurrected to eternal life. This is the thing though. It's a free will choice. It's a free will choice. You can choose. God gave you a free will. I guarantee there are going to be a lot of people in there shaking their fists at God. Even during the, even during the, the, the when the wrath that God starts getting poured out, it says he strikes them with boils. And instead of repenting even then. Yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm. Shake their fist in the face of God. Jesus. And all, see, this is the thing. God's not playing with people, y'all. He created this earth. This place belongs to him. He's the potter where the clay. The clay doesn't tell the potter how to get her done. <laughs> the potter tells the clay. You're either going to work with me when I'm forming you, yeah. or you're going to look like marred clay. You're going to get all toppled over, mangled and wrangled, and it's going to grow ugly. But even then, if you'll just let me pour some of my water on you, pour the water of the Spirit, let me soften you up a little bit. Now let's try this again. Here we go. We'll start the, the turning slow, and we'll just kind of like form you and mold you, and you yield to the hand of the pot. And if you will, he will turn you into a vessel Amen. that's beautiful in his eyes. A vessel that he will pour his spirit into and he will use to pour into other people. Amen? Amen. Okay, well, real quick, I just want to tell you about the power of resurrection. As a matter of fact, singers, musicians, y'all can come up. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. I need you to know that. Resurrection, power, and life. Hallelujah. Miracle working power. The same, let me say it again. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will quicken, bring life to your earthly body. Right now, today. And if you'll believe that, guess what? You will also partake in the resurrection of all. But he wants to give you resurrection power today, my friend. He wants to empower you today to walk with him, to talk with him, to be used. By him. Hallelujah. Romans 6, 5 says, For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, the old man died with Christ, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. I love this Philippians passage. Philippians 3, verses 10 through 11. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, we got to take communion. Amen. Thank you. That's a reminder. We're about to do that right now. We're going to incorporate that in the midst of our worship. Amen. As a matter of fact, you can start playing softly when you're ready. I wanted to tell you about the power of the resurrection, but also wanted to tell you that there's hope when things look dead. Some people going through things in their life. I guarantee if I had time right now to give microphones to a few people in here, they would be like, he's telling the truth, y'all. That's right. He's telling the truth. There's hope when things look dead. God is a God of life. He's a God of resurrection. You know, old Job, it's kind of sad in a way. Job chapter 14 Job didn't know what was hit him. We know what hit Job. We know that the, what the Lord allowed for a greater purpose. Well, why would God allow that? Because you know, in the end, you know what Job said? When, when he has tried me, yes. I shall come for yes. this gold. Yes. I shall come for this gold. Gold lasts. That's right. Gold, gold lasts. At least it comes according to earthly things. But you know. Job didn't understand what was going on, and at the time, he wanted to believe in a resurrection, but it's almost like he didn't really believe. He thought that the body was just going to waste away, but yet at the same time, he felt like there was hope, and he said something about that for a tree. He said there's even hope for a tree, that even when it's cut down, that it can sprout again. Its shoots will not fail, though its roots grow old in the ground, and its stump dies in the dry soil. At the scent of water, it will flourish and put forth sprigs like a plant. I want you to know I believe this. I believe that maybe you're feeling like a cut down stump. Maybe everything's looking dry at the scent of water, at the scent of the Holy Spirit. It will begin to bring new life.